It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker for the colloquium, Sara Zerbes from ETH in Zurich. She got her PhD from uh, Cambridge University under the director of John Cott. After that, she held the position at Exeter and University College London before joining ETH very recently. She has won several grants in Europe from EPSRC and from the ARC. She has also won a lot of prizes, uh, such, uh, such as the Philip Leverloom Prize and the Whitehead Prize. And more recently, she has been invited to speak as the up upcoming ICM in Russia this summer. So it's my pleasure to let her speak now about all her system and the Birch Swinerton Dyer conjecture. Thank you very much for, the, for, the, for this very nice introduction. Um, and of course, for the invitation to speak here. I mean, it is a great pleasure. And I very much regret, I mean, that because of the COVID situation, I mean, David and I were not able to visit Montreal in person. So I want to talk about algebraic number theory and about one of the really big and in my view, most beautiful conjectures and about the work that has been done on it recently. So let me first say a few words about number theory. So, I mean, as you may know, I mean, number theory is one of the oldest branches of mathematics. I mean, going back to the ancient Greeks and in algebraic number theory, what we're really interested in is to study the rational solutions of polynomial equations. I mean, you will have seen such equations. I mean, the most famous one is probably Pythagoras equation. I mean, x squared plus y squared is equal to z squared. And it is well known, I mean, that there are infinitely many positive rational numbers, x, y, and z, which satisfy that equation. Another famous equation is Fermat's equation, which looks very similar to Pythagoras equation, except that the exponent will now be some integer greater or equal to three. And it is now known, thanks to the beautiful work of Andrew Wiles, that there are no positive rational numbers, x, y, and z, which satisfies this equation. So even though these Pythagoras equation and Fermat's equation look very similar, we already see, I mean, that the answer to whether or not they have rational solutions can be very different indeed. So the general question is, suppose we're given a polynomial, say in n variables with rational coefficients, does it have solutions in the integers or in the rational numbers? Well, the, so let us now restrict, I mean, to equations in two variables. So the first cases that one can think of, namely linear and quadratic equations are fairly simple. So they were already well understood by Diophantus of Alexandria 2000 years ago. So the difficulty comes when we allow pubic exponents. So I want to concentrate on a certain class of equations, which are called elliptic curves, which are equations of the form y squared is equal to x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are rational numbers. And we assume that this quantity 4a cubed plus 27b squared is not equal to zero. So this will guarantee, I mean, that when we draw the real graph, I mean, of this curve, that it doesn't have cusps or self intersections. So the challenge is to find the pairs of rational numbers X and Y, which satisfy this equation. Of course, you may ask, I mean, why should one care about elliptic curves and about this question of finding the rational points on such a curve? Well, it turns out that elliptic curves look in the background of many famous problems in number theory. So for example, they played a crucial role in Wiles' proof of Fermat's last theorem. But I want to give you another example where elliptic curves are sort of hiding in the background, which is again very famous and has been studied for several centuries, namely the so-called congruent number problem. So let us go back to a Pythagoras equation. And suppose that we take a Pythagorean triple, which are positive rational numbers, ABC, which satisfy a Pythagoras equation. So they are the sides of a right angled triangle. Okay, so what can we say about this triangle? Well, for example, its area is a half AB. So it's trivial. Now the question is, can we determine which areas arise in this way? So we make the following definition. 
we say that a positive integer n is congruent if there exists a Pythagorean triple such that the area of the corresponding triangle is equal to n. So in other words, n is congruent if and only if there exist positive rational numbers a, b, c, which simultaneously satisfy the following two equations. So, uh, I mean, it seems like a fairly trivial problem, right? I mean, to determine whether or not the number is congruent. Because after all, I mean, we do understand the solutions of Pythagoras equation. Well, okay, let's look at a few examples. Well, six is congruent. I mean, that's obvious. I mean, from the first Pythagorean triple in nature, I mean, three, four, five. Five is congruent. Well, that's already a bit less obvious, right? I mean, you might get there by trial and error. But then also 127 is congruent. And I challenge you, I mean, to find that just by experimentation. So maybe, just maybe, the concept of a congruent number is not that trivial after all. The first question is, is every positive integer congruent? Well, no. That was already known to Pierre de Fermat, who proved that one is not a congruent number. So in other words, there exists no uh, right angle triangle with rational sides and area one. And he proved this, I mean, using something which we now call a descent algorithm. And this descent algorithm, I mean, you should bear in mind because this will come up again and again in this lecture. So amusingly, I mean, from this theorem, one can deduce Fermat's last theorem when the exponent is equal to four. So yeah, I find this a rather pretty application and it is actually not very difficult. Okay, so not every positive integer is congruent. What else is known about congruent numbers? Well, in the 1990s, Monsky proved some results about when P is, I mean, a prime P is a congruent number. And more recently, Yi Tian proved some results on congruent numbers with many prime factors. But the following question is still open. Given an integer n, can we determine in a finite number of steps whether or not n is a congruent number? We do not know an answer to this. I mean, in fact, the reality is a little bit more complicated here. There is an algorithm, and this algorithm has so far worked in every case that we have tried, but we cannot prove that the algorithm will always finish. And I should maybe mention that this algorithm is based on this descent algorithm, which Fermat used to prove that one is not a congruent number. So he really developed a very powerful tool there. Okay, so that's a congruent number problem. That's all very nice, but what does it have to do with elliptic curves? Well, here's the theorem. And positive integer n is congruent if and only if the elliptic curve y squared is equal to x cubed minus n squared x has a rational solution x, y, where y is not equal to zero. I mean, of course, when y is equal to zero, I mean, x has to be zero or plus minus n. So in some sense, these are the obvious solutions, the obvious rational solutions, I mean, of this elliptic curve equation. So n is congruent if and only if there exists a non-obvious rational point on the elliptic curve. So how does one prove this? Well, in some sense, one just writes it down explicitly. So suppose that we have a Pythagorean triple ABC such that the area of the corresponding triangle is equal to N, then we can write down X and Y, which you can easily check satisfy this equation. And certainly Y is not you know, going to be zero. And conversely, I mean, given X and Y, where Y is not equal to zero, we can write down a Pythagorean triple, which has the right properties. So I hope that this example convinces you that the question of finding the rational points on elliptic curves is something really worth studying. So let's have a closer look at elliptic curves. So suppose you're given an elliptic curve, we then define the set of rational points on the elliptic curve, 
to be the set of pairs of rational numbers x and y which satisfy this equation. Now it turns out that this set of rational points has a very rich arithmetic structure. Namely, it has a structure of an abelian group. And one can really see explicitly how this group law works. So let us draw the real points on an elliptic curve. So this is drawn in red. I mean, so it will be symmetric. I mean, in the x-axis. And suppose that we are given two rational points, P and Q. So how do we add them together? Well, we take the line through these two points because we're dealing with a cubic equation. I mean, it will intersect the graph in precisely one other point, which, will, which one can prove to be rational. And if we reflect this point in the x-axis, this is the definition of the point P plus Q. One can check that this really defines an abelian group law where the additive identity is a point at infinity. But that's already very nice because it means that given some rational points, you can use this group law to generate more rational points. But it turns out that even more is true. Namely, we have the celebrated theorem of Mordell that it is a finitely generated abelian group. And this is really wonderful because it means that we can use a classification of finitely generated abelian groups to say that the group is isomorphic to a finite group delta E, which is a torsion subgroup of the elliptic curve, and a number of copies of the integers. And this number of copies is a very important variant, invariant of the elliptic curve, and it is called the rank of the elliptic curve. So thanks to model theorem, we now have two arithmetic invariants attached to the elliptic curve, namely the torsion subgroup and the rank. And it turns out that one is much deeper than the other. So the torsion subgroup is very well understood. I mean, Mesa has shown that there, well, I've forgotten how many different possibilities there are, but there aren't many possibilities what the torsion subgroup can be. But the rank is much more mysterious. So let's look at an example. Suppose that we take again an elliptic curve which arises from the congruent number problem. So it's of the form y squared is x cubed minus n squared x. So in this case, one can show that the torsion subgroup is isomorphic to z modulo 2 squared. And the points, the torsion points on the elliptic curve are precisely the point at infinity and these points where the y coordinate is equal to zero. So in other words, those points which do not contribute any triangles. So this means that the integer n is congruent if and only if the elliptic curve has positive rank. So in particular, we can rephrase Fermat's result into saying that the curve y squared is equal to x, that the, yeah, that the curve for n equals one has rank zero. So let us look at a few more examples. So one can show that y squared equal to x cubed minus 26 squared x has rank zero. So 26 is not a congruent number. For n equal to 31, the elliptic curve has rank one. So 31 is congruent. And when n is equal to 34, the rank is two. So in other words, 34 is very congruent. There exist lots and lots of right angled rational triangles where the area is equal to 34. What else is known about the rank? Well, so Bhargava and his collaborator showed that at least 83% of elliptic curves have rank zero or one. And it is indeed expected that 100% of elliptic curves have rank zero or one. So elliptic curves of large rank should actually be quite rare. So what is an open problem by which we do not know how to solve is to find an algorithm known to finish which computes the rank of an elliptic curve. So of course, I mean, in the case for elliptic curves coming from the congruent number problems that reduces precisely I mean, to the question of determining whether or not a positive integer n is congruent. So, and again, the truth is a bit more complicated. We have an algorithm 
based on Fermat's descent um, argument. And it has worked so far in every example we have tried, but we cannot prove that the algorithm will always finish. And it turns out that this question of showing that the algorithm will always finish is related to one of the deepest conjectures in number theory. And in order to explain that, I need to talk about L functions of elliptic curves. Okay. So suppose now that we are given an elliptic curve where A and B are actually integers. So this is not too hard to arrange because we can always rescale X and Y, I mean, to clear the denominators. So if we then take a prime P, we can reduce this equation modulo P for every prime P. And for almost all P, so for all but finitely many, we actually get an elliptic curve defined over the field with P elements. So this is just um, a reduction map, I mean, on the equation, but it turns out that there is also a reduction map on the set of points. So there is a reduction map from the group of rational points on the elliptic curve to the group of FP points on the elliptic curve modulo P. So suppose now that the elliptic curve has positive rank. So there are lots and lots of rational points. Then somehow one would expect that this should be reflected in the image of the reduction map. So the idea is that the asymptotic behavior of the number of points on E modulo P should tell us something about the rank of the elliptic curve. So the first question, I mean, to test this is to ask how large can this number of points on E modulo P be? Well, there is quite a simple heuristic that the expected number of points is equal to P plus one. And this was proved by Hasse that if you look at the difference between the expected number of points and the real number of points on E modulo P, then this difference is never that large namely that the absolute value of the difference is bounded by two times the square root of P. So remember now our expectation. If the rank of the elliptic curve is large, then there should be a bias towards the number of points on E modulo P to be large as P varies over all the primes. So in other words, this quantity AP should be more of negative as P varies over all the primes. So what I now want to do is, I want to write down a function in one complex variable, which just depends on the following data, the so prime P and the number of points on the elliptic curve modulo P. So, well, there are lots of functions you could potentially write down. I mean, this is the function I'm going to choose. So it is a polynomial in P to the minus S. I mean, where S is a complex variable. And this is called the local L factor of the elliptic curve. And there, is, there are reasons, I mean, why this is the right function to consider. And I now want to express our expectation in terms of the properties of this function. Well, okay, there is a problem, of course, because we only expect that, um, I mean, that our expectation should only hold as P varies over all the prime numbers. So, it, so this leads to the following definition, which we call the L function of the elliptic curve, which is the product over all the primes of these local L factors. So we get an infinite product which probably reminds you a bit of the product expansion of the Riemann zeta function, which is again a product of local terms in, in each term is the inverse of a polynomial in P to the minus S. And you will not be surprised to learn that this is not a coincidence. I mean, there is a good reason why these, these functions are structurally similar. Now, before we can analyze the properties of this function, we need to know whether it actually converges anywhere. And the answer is yes. This follows from Hasse's inequality, which we saw earlier, that this L function converges when the real part of S is bigger than three over two. 
And it follows from Wyatt's important work on the Chanyama Shimura conjecture that the L function indeed has analytic continuation to all of the complex plane. And now we are in a very good position to study its properties. So remember our expectation. If the rank of the elliptic curve is positive, then the values of the L function should be small when S is small. So let us look at a few examples. So we look again at these elliptic curves that we have seen before, which arise from the congruent number problems. In the case when N is 26, 31, and 34. Now you're all muted. I mean, in a normal class, I would now ask, do you remember what the ranks were? Is anyone nodding? <laughs> right, right, you remember that the ranks were zero, one, and two. So we, I've drawn the graphs, I mean, before analytic continuation, let's see what happens when we analytically continue. So we see that something really exciting and unexpected happens at the point S equals one. Namely for N equal to 26, where the rank is equal to zero, the function does not vanish. Whereas for the two elliptic curves where the rank is positive, the L functions do vanish at this point. So they vanish to even and odd order. And one can check numerically that they vanish to orders one and two. So let us summarize. We have three elliptic curves of ranks zero, one, and two. And we have the corresponding L functions, which at this point S equals one, vanish to orders zero, one, and two. And this is not a coincidence. This is the celebrated conjecture of Birch and Swinner and Dyer. So this conjecture was formulated in 1963 on the basis of numerical experimentation. So what does it say? Well, unsurprisingly, I mean, it says that the order of vanishing of the L function at the point S equals one is equal to the rank of the elliptic curve. So this order of vanishing is generally called the analytic rank. So what this conjecture says is that the analytic rank is equal to the algebraic rank. And there is a refined version. Namely, if we take this L function and we develop it as a Taylor series around this point S equals one, then there should be an explicit formula for the leading term in terms of the arithmetic invariance of the elliptic curve. And these arithmetic invariants involve, for example, the order of the torsion subgroup, and it involves a very mysterious invariant, namely the so-called tate shafarevich group of the elliptic curve. And it is part of the conjecture, but not known, that Sha of E is finite. And it turns out that the question of whether or not Sha is finite is closely linked up with the descent algorithm. Namely, one can show that if Sha of E is finite, then the descent algorithm to come compute the rank does finish. So this is an open problem, which we do not know how to solve. So let me make a few remarks here about this conjecture. I mean, I find it extremely remarkable that it was, um, that it was formulated on the basis of numerical experimentation because at the time in the 1960s, there was precisely one computer in Cambridge. So Brian Birch gave a very nice uh, talk about his, um, these experimentations. I mean, at the Swinnerton Dia Memorial Conference last May. And he actually said, I mean, that mathematicians were at the bottom of the priority list for numerical computations. So they were only allocated time, I mean, during the nights. So they spent rather a lot of nights, I mean, waiting for the experiments to finish. And they were assisted, I mean, by a young lady, I mean, who helped them with, the compu with, with uh, using the computer. And it was quite amusing. I mean, when Brian said, we had a lot of time during these nights to get to know each other and we got married two years later. So, I mean, of course, I mean, these days, I mean, as you just saw, I mean, one can check the BSD conjecture um, just on one's home computer. I mean, using mathematical software, I mean, that was developed by Tim and Vladimir Dokshitsa. 
Okay, so I mean, this conjecture has been hugely influential in number theory. I mean, one can really say without exaggeration that it has shaped the landscape, I mean, of number theory in the last 50 years, 60 years. Okay, so I mean, nowadays, I mean, this conjecture is just the first instance, I mean, of a huge network of conjectures. I mean, there are some immediate generalizations. So if one can formulate the BSC conjecture for elliptic curves defined over number fields, one can equally formulate it for abelian varieties. So these are varieties, well, say over number fields or over Q, such that the rational points have the structure of a finitely generated abelian group. But that's not the end of the story. There are many other objects which come with L functions attached. For example, general algebraic varieties, or what we call motifs, which are in some sense pieces of the geometry of an algebraic variety. So the question is, can one formulate an analog of the BSD conjecture for these L functions? So can we attach some arithmetic interpretation to certain values of, this, of these L functions? And the answer is yes, at least conjecturally. So that uh, was discovered by Spencer Bloch and Kazuya Kato in the 1990s, who formulated the following conjecture. So suppose we're given a motif M, then the order of vanishing at the point S equals one of the L function of the dual motif measures the size of a certain cohomology group, the so-called Selma group attached to the motif. So if, to, give a, to explain the relation to the BSC conjecture. So if we consider the motif attached to an elliptic curve, then this Selma group is very closely bound up with a group of rational points on the elliptic curve. So we nearly, nearly rediscover the BSD conjecture. In fact, I mean, if we assume that Char is finite, I mean, then this reduces to the BSD conjecture. So that's all very nice. I mean, that tells us something about the an interpretation about the analytic rank at the point S equals one. What about the other integer values? Well, so there is a notion of twisting a motive by an integer. And for this twisted motive, the bloch kato conjecture says the following, namely that the order of vanishing at the point one minus n of the L function of the dual motive governs the size of the Selma group of the twisted motive. So we really get an, an, an arithmetic interpretation of the values of the L function at all of the integers. And it is, this, is, it is these two conjectures, the bloch kato conjecture and the BSD conjecture, which really have been the focus of my research in the last uh, probably 10 years. So I now want to go back to the original BSD conjecture. As I said, it is still open, but some very important work, I mean, due to Kolivagen and later, I mean, alternative proof was found by Kato, I mean, has been done. So Kolivagen proved the following result. So suppose we take an elliptic curve defined over the rational numbers. If the analytic rank is equal to zero or one, then the BSD conjecture holds. Namely, the analytic rank is equal to the algebraic rank. Okay. So I now want to focus on the case when the L function does not vanish at the point S equals one. So when the analytic rank is equal to zero, because this turns out to be a case which is amenable to generalizations. So how does Kolivagen prove this result? Well, the first step is to recall the modularity theorem, which was proven by Wiles and Taylor Wiles and others, which says, that motifs of elliptic curves correspond to motifs of certain modular forms. Well, what's a modular form? Well, a modular form is a holomorphic function on the complex upper half plane, which has lots and lots of symmetries. So these symmetries are illustrated by this tessellation of the upper half plane. 
where maybe you think this kind of picture looks familiar. Well, then you might be thinking of Escher's lizards. I mean, he tessellates the complex upper half plane, I mean, in a very similar way. Okay, so thanks to this modularity theorem, it is now sufficient to prove the bloch cato conjecture in analytic rank zero for motives of modular forms. There is, of course, a question. I mean, why should that be any easier? What's the advantage in thinking about modular forms? Well, the, cru the crucial tool in Kolivagin's work is what's called an Euler system. I don't want to go into the definition. I mean, the idea is it is an infinite collection of geometric um, objects which are defined over number fields and which then in certain relations to each other. And these relations mirror the local terms of the L function. So one should think of it as some kind of arithmetic avatar of the L function. Now, a vital input for the construction of Kolivagen's Euler system is what we call a Shimura variety, which is a variety which arises from the representation theory of matrix groups. So there is a huge industry, I mean, in studying properties of Shimura varieties. I mean, they play a crucial role in the study of the Langlands program. Now, the reason why they're important in our context is that motives of modular forms appear inside the Shimura variety attached to the a general linear group GL2. And these Shimura varieties have a special name. They are called modular curves. So in this means that Kolivagen could build his Euler system using tools from the representation theory of GL2. Now, the main question which has motivated my research, or I should say my joint research with David Loeffler was, can we extend Kolivagen's idea to build Euler systems for other Shimura varieties? So before I explain what we have and haven't been able to do, let me explain why it would be useful to have such an Euler system. Now, Shimura varieties come attached with what are called automorphic forms, which are generalizations of modular forms to groups other than GL2. So one example, which you may have heard about before, are automorphic forms for the symplectic group GSP4, which are so-called genus two Siegel modular forms. Now, automorphic forms generally give rise to motifs, and it is generally expected that many naturally occurring motifs correspond to motifs arising from automorphic forms. And results of this form are called modularity results. So we have already seen one example of such a result, namely why it's modularity theorem, who prove that motifs of elliptic curves correspond to motifs of modular forms. So this was extended, I mean, to elliptic curves over imaginary quadratic fields, which can be shown to correspond to the motifs attached to genus to Siegel modular forms. Well, that's not known in full generality, but it's mostly known thanks to beautiful work of Alan Curry and Thorne. And more generally, it is expected that motifs are attached to abelian surfaces should again correspond to genus to Siegel modular forms. And there are some partial results due to Boxer, Caligari, G, and Pilon. Okay, so suppose now that we have an Euler system for Shimura variety and assume that we know that this Euler system is non-trivial. This is an important point that I will come back to later. So suppose we have such an Euler system we can then use a very well-established tool, the so-called Euler system machine, to obtain applications to the bloch cato conjecture for the automorphic forms arising from the Shimura variety. So this Euler system machine was developed by Cato and Carl Rubin. So that's already very nice, but we can do even better if we combine this with the expected modularity results because this will give new cases of the birch swinner and Dyer conjecture. Okay, in other words, Euler systems are very powerful tools. 
It's just a pity that they're rather difficult to construct. I mean, if you, until a few years ago, only about four examples were known to exist. Well, in 2014, together with Antonio Ley and David Loeffler, we constructed a new Euler system for the Shimura variety of GL2 times GL2. So of course, the Shimura variety is just a product of two modular curves. So we could then, I mean, run the Euler system machine and obtain the following result, I mean, jointly with Guido Kings. Suppose we take two modular forms, F and G, and suppose that N is a critical value, which is, which is an integer in a certain range, which is determined by F and G. If the value of the L function does not vanish at this point, then the block cato conjecture holds for the tensor product of the motives of F and G twisted by this integer N. In a moment, I will say a few words about how we proved this, uh, this result. But let me just make the following remark. So if we combine this with Wyatt's modularity results, then we obtain applications to the equivariant BSD conjecture for elliptic curves in analytic rank zero. Well, what do I mean by equivariant BSD? I mean a version of the BSD conjecture for an elliptic curve twisted by a two-dimensional odd artin representation. And I should say, I mean, that's a rank part of BSD. I mean, was already known in this case, thanks to beautiful work of Bertolini, Damon, and Roger. So we could somewhat reprove and strengthen their results because we also obtain some results towards the finiteness of the tate shaffer group. Okay, so these are some very nice results. How do we prove them? Well, step one is of course the construction of the Euler system. So this uses tools from, geom from the geometry of the Shimura variety, and it uses tools from smooth representation theory. So we then need to make a link with the L function to prove that the Euler system that we had constructed is non-trivial. So such a result is called an explicit reciprocity law. So it gives the relation between the Euler system on the one side and values of the L function on the other side. So let me just emphasize, and this is a difficult result because it builds a bridge between an algebraic or let's say geometric object and an analytic object, namely the L function. And the tools that we use to prove are totally different from those that we use in the construction of the Euler system. Namely, it uses tools from periodic geometry and periodic analysis. So once we have these two steps, I mean, the rest is easy. So we deduce that if the L function doesn't vanish at this critical value N, then the Euler system is non-trivial, thanks to the explicit reciprocity law. And then we just run the Euler system machine to deduce that the Selma group is zero. So that's an outline of the proof. So the difficult steps are the construction of the Euler system and the proof of the explicit reciprocity law. So this is the case of GL2 times GL2. To our great surprise, the methods that we introduce for constructing this Euler system are applicable in great generality. So in 2018, I mean, together with Antonio Ley and David, I mean, we constructed an Euler system for um, a Hilbert modular surface. So, uh, which is a Shimura variety for GL2 over F, where F is a real quadratic field. I mean, our construction was later refined by my former student, Jada Grossi. Together with Skinner, we constructed an Euler system for a Siegel threefold, which is a Shimura variety attached to the symplectic group GSP4. We also constructed one for a Picard modular surface attached to the group GU21. Then we had an Arizona project group, I mean, Su Jin and Sakamoto, who constructed an Euler system for GSP4 times GL2. And uh, recently, my former student Andy Graham, together with Shrenik Shah, constructed an infinite family of Euler systems attached to unitary groups. And amusingly, I mean, this is a straight generalization of Koli Wagen's original Euler system, which is the case when n is equal to one. 
So these are just some of the cases. I mean, there are many more that we can study. Well, that's awesome, right? I mean, does that mean now that we can prove many new cases of the bloch cato conjecture? Well, and this is where the problem came. Namely, we need an explicit reciprocity law. We need to be able to link the Euler system to the L function. And this turned out to be extremely difficult. I mean, there is a well-established strategy to introduce some kind of intermediate object, which is called a periodic L function, which is some kind of periodic analog, I mean, of the complex L function. So, I mean, this strategy was first introduced by Bertolini, Damon, and Prasanna. And in the case of the GL2 times GL2 Euler system, we were able to make this strategy work. But we crucially used there that the Shimura variety is the product of two modular curves. In none of the other cases were we able to prove the, uh, to this explicit reciprocity law. In fact, we couldn't even construct the Pierre de Gale function. So we got stuck at the very first step. So we were in a really unfortunate situation. I mean, there we were, we had all of these new uh, Euler systems and we couldn't prove that a single one of them was non-trivial. So that was intensely frustrating and we were stuck on that, I mean, for quite a long time. And not just us, I mean, there were also other research groups, I mean, who tried very hard, I mean, to construct the periodic L functions and to prove the explicit reciprocity laws. So, I, yeah, I mean, well, these two years, I mean, where we struggled that, with that really were not terribly pleasant. And uh, I'm sometimes reminded, I mean, of the struggles, I mean, of the three men, I mean, from the famous novel, Three Men in a Boat, when they try and open a tin of pineapples without a tin opener. So here's the quote, which did describe our situation rather well. We beat it out flat, we beat it back square, we battered it into every shape known to geometry, but we could not make a hole in it. Well, the story of the three men continues as follows. There was one great dent across the top of the tin that had the appearance of a mocking grin, and it drove us furious, and we flung it far into the middle of the river. Well, let's just say, I mean, we were not far off. I mean, from following the example. I mean, I certainly saw the mocking grin, I mean, on quite a number of occasions. But then in November 2017, a miracle happened. So David and I attended a conference in Princeton where Vincent Piloni gave a talk on a new tool that he had developed, which is called higher heater theory. And it was clear to us within minutes, and David would probably say this in seconds, but he has always been a bit faster than me, that this was the missing piece that we needed for constructing the periodic L function. So, and we were able, together with um, Vincent Piloni and Chris Skinner, to use this higher heater theory to construct a periodic L function for genus two Siegel modular forms. And on the basis of this construction, David and I were able to prove an explicit reciprocity law for the GSP4 Euler system. So which gives a link between the Euler system for um, the Siegel threefold on the one hand and the L function attached to genus two Siegel modular forms on the other hand. So, I mean, you can see it still took us a couple of years, I mean, to complete this. Well, let's just say, I mean, the proof is a bit of a nightmare. I mean, we use many different tools. I mean, just to list some ingredients, we use rigid geometry, we use various periodic cohomology theories. I mean, rigid cohomology, syntomic cohomology, log rigid syntomic cohomology and whatnot. So uh, we use the theory of periodic integration due to Coleman and later generalized by Amnon Besser. We use Iwasawa theory. We use periodic Hodge theory as developed by Fontaine and Perriou and many other tools. Okay, 
However, it was worth it because we could now harvest the arithmetic applications. So the first application is a proof of the Bloch-Cato conjecture in analytic rank zero for the critical twist of genus two Siegel modular forms. Okay, let me make a few remarks here. Firstly, I mean, we assume some technical hypotheses such as uh, for the experts, I mean, that the Galois representation attached to the genus two Siegel modular forms has large image. We need this in order to be able to use the Euler system machine. But here's another remark for the few experts, I mean, which are in the room. So in the, in the paper, I mean, where we prove this result, which is on the archive, we assume a result which we call the eigenspace vanishing conjecture. So a proof of that result had been announced, but certainly never been written up. So, I mean, that was rather frustrating because this result was conditional on this eigenspace vanishing conjecture. Well, I'm happy to say that we have now found a way around it. So the result is no longer uh, dependent on this conjecture. Right, so, I mean, this is the first application. If we now combine this with the expected modularity results, we get the following um, application to BSD. So assuming some technical hypotheses, for example, I mean, non, not complex multiplication and so on, the birch swinnerton and Dyer conjecture in analytic rank zero holds for modular elliptic curves over imaginary quadratic fields and for modular abelian surfaces. So uh, finally, there we were after many years of work. So let me finish with a few remarks. So I had mentioned that our Arizona project group had constructed an Euler system attached to the Shimura variety of GSP4 times GL2. So both the constructions of a Piadegel function and the proof of the explicit reciprocity, to, uh, explicit reciprocity law go through basically verbatim to this case. So in the same way, I mean, we then obtain applications to the bloch cato conjecture. I mean, for the, um, the product, I mean, of or the rankin selberg convolution, I mean, of genus two Siegel modular forms and classical modular forms. And by using the suitable modularity results, we get, we get an analog of this result of Bertolini, Damon, and Roger, namely of, to the equivariant BSD conjecture, where the modular abelian surfaces are twisted by two-dimensional odd artin representations. So again, I mean, we get a result in analytic rank zero. And let me finish, I mean, with the following remark. So uh, I've now talked about the Euler systems for GSP4 and for GSP4 times GL2, but the methods that we have introduced both for the construction of the Piadegel function and for the proof of the explicit reciprocity law should generalize to all of these cases. So, I mean, this is work in progress, I mean, by us and I mean, by some of our students and former students, and this will hopefully have many more interesting applications, I mean, to the bloch cato conjecture and the birch swinnerton dyer conjecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very difficult talk. And uh, I think we have plenty of time for questions. So if anybody wants to speak. Yes, Sarah, I have a, a question. Hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for such a carefully prepared lecture. And I, I, I apologize for my lack of knowledge in number theory, but here is my question. You gave an, uh, ex examples of L functions uh, having uh, for which the order of the zero at one was zero, one, and two. Uh, yeah. Uh, can, 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 uh, can this be uh, included in a, embedded in a theory which would include uh, order minus one and the Riemann zeta function? 
Uh, well, I mean, the Riemann zeta function is a bit of a special case. I mean, because, I mean, if one is, I mean, in most cases, I mean, this cannot occur. I mean, so, uh, I mean, we will only get a pole. Um, I mean, if the, if the Galois representation, I mean, arising from the motive, I mean, I think has a quotient, I mean, which is isomorphic to, uh, to the trivial representation. So, uh, I mean, this can, I mean, it is true. I mean, certainly for the Riemann zeta function, I mean, you will also, I mean, have some arithmetic interpretation, I mean, for leading terms I mean, and so on. But um, I think in general, I mean, these cases uh, do not occur now. I mean, yeah, or only in some degenerate cases. Mm. Thank uh, you very much. Just wondering in this last corollary, do the methods have a chance to work over say uh, for modular abelian surfaces over totally real fields or uh, elliptic curves over CM fields? Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that is an excellent question. So, um, well, there are sort of, there is a problem with an Euler, con with an Euler system construction, I mean, over number fields. I mean, we can deal with imaginary quadratic fields, I mean, but in generally, in general, I mean, the methods we have introduced are quite limited. Um, so if I totally real fields, I mean, it is possible that one could do something, I mean, with variance, I mean, of the Euler, sy of the Euler system, I mean, which, well, Henri might actually have something to say, hello, Henri, um, or Victor, for example, I mean, where you talk about cycle type Euler systems, but in general, I mean, not in our case, I mean, so, I mean, the Shimura, let's just say the Shimura varieties that we can get at, I mean, they have a special property, namely that we can embed into them, I mean, several copies, or one copy or several copies of GL2, because the geometric tools that we use arise from GL2, and we then push them forward, I mean, to the Shimura, to the Shimura variety, I mean, of the bigger group. So there are limits, I mean, to what we can achieve there, sadly. I mean, well, for the experts, I mean, what we use, so the tools that we use, I mean, on GL2 are called Siegel units, which are some kind of cohomological incarnation, I mean, of GL2 Eisenstein series. We would need an analog of those for other groups, and those we simply don't have. I mean, if we had those, then I'm quite confident, I mean, that our methods could be applied, I mean, much more generally, I mean, to give Euler systems, I mean, over um, number fields. So it is a very good question, but I mean, sadly, the answer so far is no. Unless I see, thanks. So it, it, it all comes back to the fact that you only have Siegel units over modular curves and there's no good indeed. analog of that. Okay. Yes, indeed. I mean, Thank I you. should make a remark there. I mean, so Faltings has written down some analogs of Siegel units, I mean, for uh, the symplectic groups. But in some sense, I mean, they, are, they correspond to Eisenstein series uh, attached to the wrong parabolic subgroup. I mean, my student, my former student, Antonio Kauki tried very hard, I mean, to use those, I mean, to construct a new Euler system. And it simply can't be done. I mean, they are simply the wrong kind of generalization. Thank you. Yes, just a comment, Sarah. I, I think your construction for just before times GL2 times GL2. Yes. That would generalize to totally real fields. Uh, yes, this well, is correct. This is correct, but this is a kind of cycle type Euler system. Exactly. I mean, this is, I mean, this is totally correct. I mean, I should have mentioned that, that we have done work there, but in some, well, okay, I mean, it's good David doesn't hear me, but I mean, in some sense, I mean, this was just a sort of uh, byproduct, I mean, of our work of GSP4 and GSP4 times GL2. I mean, it is not a case that I have personally studied in great detail. I mean, I'm going to give that to one of my PhD students to think about, but uh, thanks for pointing that out. I mean, it's a rather embarrassing omission. <laughs> and so just, just a technical question, maybe you, you hate me for this. Was the workaround to avoid to, uh, to use the, uh, eigen, like the eigenspace conjecture? Oh, I, I don't hate you for that at all. I mean, that we only did this in the last few weeks, so I'm actually really happy to oh. talk about it. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so the point of the eigenspace vanishing conjecture is one has to show that in the rigid cohomology of certain strata of the special fiber of the Shimura variety, 
uh, certain hacker eigenspaces can't occur. I mean, there was a strategy for this. I mean, using proving some analogs of recent work of Scholz, Karayani, and the trace formula. But I mean, it just sounded totally horrendous. So in some sense, I mean, the previous method used the, um, the hacker eigenspace away from P. What we have found uh, we can do is to use the, uh, the hacker operators at P and uh, to sort of play with their weights. So we are currently in the process of writing that up, but it sort of shows, I mean, that, um, I mean, we need the eigenspace vanishing conjecture, I mean, to show, I mean, that certain pairings uh, are going to be zero. And it turns out that one can very nicely do that um, when, uh, when one compares the weights, I mean, of the Hecker eigenvalues at P. So, uh, I mean, I should maybe say, I mean, it is quite funny because David and I went for a walk, I mean, in the snow in the mountains, I mean, while, while still thinking about that. And at some point, I mean, we actually stopped and started scribbling uh, formulae with our walking sticks into the snow. So at the end of the walk, we were actually convinced, I mean, that uh, this method might actually work. I mean, fingers crossed it isn't written up yet, but uh, we are at least fairly confident of it. Okay, thanks. Okay, any more questions from the audience? Um, yeah. Can I, yeah. Uh, thank you for the beautiful talk. Since you gave such a beautiful overview of, of all the recent um, generalizations, can you say a few words about rank one? What, what is the obstacle in extending rank one from Um Well, it is, the it is the gross Zaghi formula. I mean, that so, is, I mean, right. that is the main obstacle. I mean, what I did sweep a bit under the carpet is our work really is a generalization of Cato's approach. So, and Cato's approach, I mean, works in rank zero. And this is what we generalize. So, I mean, this is the main obstacle. And I mean, in our case, I mean, we have no idea, I mean, how to attack rank bigger than zero. I mean, there one really needs a new idea, a new way, a new way, I mean, of using an Euler system, I mean, in analytic rank one, I mean, I really don't know. I mean, David, I mean, do you want to say something about that? I just mm -hmm. noticed you entering. And yeah, I guess one could um, could look at it this way. Um, you can you can generalize Kolivagin's Euler system to write down various families of algebraic cycles, and there are there is at least some some hope that one might be able to show some kind of arithmetic gangrose prasad type formula saying that the cycles are non-trivial in the cow group when the analytic rank is exactly one. But in order to make an Euler system argument work, you need to deduce that if the cycle is non-trivial in the Chow group, then its image in the Ital cohomology is non-trivial in the in Ital cohomology. And that's extremely hard and sort of standard conjecture is hard. I think nobody has any idea how to attack that. I mean, one would need to know for that, for example, I mean, the injectivity of the Ital regulator uh, on motivic cohomology. And I mean, we have talked to specialists, I mean, on these kind of questions. And they say, I mean, there's no hope. So, uh, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, I don't see any raise hand. Well, anybody from the room? No. Well, I'm quite happy to <laughs> sort of hang around for a few minutes oh. um, in case there are other questions. I oh. would like, by the way, I would like to thank you all, I mean, from, for moving the timings, I mean, of the colloquium. Um, the point is, it is now seven o'clock in the evening here, so, and I wasn't that keen on giving a talk at eight thirty on a Friday evening. So, oh yeah, no, I can, we can imagine <laughs> there are better things to do. So, thanks again for the very beautiful talk. And...